We've seen that if the conditions of the first welfare theorem are not violated, then prices will coordinate consumers and firms in such a way that the markets will produce the efficient level of output. But if that price signal is disturbed, the very thing that's producing that efficiency is disturbed, and so that efficiency is no longer going to hold. Now the most explicit way in which we could disturb prices is by having governments distort those prices. They could distort those prices by saying you can't charge more than a certain price, or you can't charge less than a certain price. Those kinds of policies are called price ceilings and price floors. Now, if the government sets a price ceiling, it says you can't charge more than a certain price. And if it sets that price ceiling above the equilibrium price, the policy would have no effect because the market doesn't want a price above that ceiling anyways. So in order for a price ceiling to have an effect, you'd have to set it below the equilibrium price. If the government sets a price floor, it says you can't charge a price below this price. If it would set that price floor below the equilibrium price, that would have no effect because the market doesn't want a price below that anyways. So in order for a price floor to have an effect, it would have to be set above the equilibrium price. Now in both of these cases, the most obvious result is that the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied is going to change at those price ceilings and price floors. At this price ceiling, firms are no longer going to want to produce the quantity they produced before, so the quantity supplied is going to fall. But at that lower price, consumers would like to buy more, so the quantity demanded is increasing. So the quantity demanded is no longer equal to the quantity supplied, which means we're no longer in equilibrium. So we have a disequilibrium. Similarly, in this case, the price is set above the equilibrium price, which means firms would love to produce more at that higher price. So we have an increase in the quantity supplied, but consumers don't want to buy as much at that higher price. So we have the decrease in the quantity demanded, again giving us a disequilibrium. Now in this case, the quantity demanded is larger than the quantity supplied, which means there is a shortage. Consumers want to buy more than what producers produce. So this would be a disequilibrium shortage. On this side, we have producers who are producing more than what consumers want. So that's a surplus. There's too much being produced. So this is a disequilibrium surplus. Now, when we're in disequilibrium, something's going to have to happen to re-establish an equilibrium. It can't be that we just get stuck in a disequilibrium. So what's that going to be in this case? Well, in the absence of any other policies, we're going to see an effect on demand and supply. So in this case, consumers want all these goods that are being produced here, but there are way too many of them. So they know that if they're going to be the ones to get to this limited supply of goods, they're going to have to exert effort. They're going to have to do something. They're going to have to get up early in the morning and stand in line. They're going to have to bribe somebody. They're going to have to do something. And when they exert effort, that's an additional price they pay, an additional cost that they pay. So if you think about what that does to the demand curve, if originally you were willing to pay this price, you're now going to be willing to pay a lower price because you know you still have to pay that effort cost as well. So when consumers have to exert effort to get to the goods, it's going to shift the demand curve. It's going to shift it down by the effort cost. So if we add our supply curve here, we can see that that means we're going to shift that intersection down the supply curve. So as consumers exert effort in this picture, demand is going to shift, and we're going to shift that intersection down that supply curve. And the new equilibrium is established when that intersection happens right here at the quantity supplied. 
if that happens, the quantity demanded is equal to the quantity supplied again, and we're once again in equilibrium. And we can see in this picture how big that effort cost has to be. It has to be big enough to shift the demand curve down by this distance. It has to shift it down by this distance for the demand curve to cross here. So on a per unit basis, this is how much effort consumers are going to have to exert to get to the limited quantity of goods. Which means that if we add to the price that they pay to the sellers, the cost of the effort they had to exert to get to the goods, the consumer's price is going to be up here. They're going to only pay this much in cash, but the rest they're going to pay as an effort cost to make sure they get to the goods. So the price for consumers goes up, the price for sellers goes down to the price ceiling. In this case over here, we've got a kind of reversal. Here, suppliers are providing more than what consumers are demanding. We have a surplus. So now it's the firms that are going to have to worry. They would love to sell at this high price, but they have to find a way of getting the goods to the consumers who want them because there's a limited number of them. So they're going to have to exert effort to make sure they're the ones to be able to sell their goods because they don't want to get stuck with goods that they can't sell. So if we think about what that does to the supply curve, we can remember that that supply curve is made up of marginal cost curves. So if firms have to exert effort to get their goods to markets, that's an additional marginal cost of getting goods to the consumers. And that additional marginal cost is going to shift supply up. If we add our demand curve to that picture, we can see that that intersection is going to slide up the demand curve as the supply curve shifts. So in this picture, as the supply curve shifts, that intersection moves up along the demand curve and eventually will cross right here. And when it crosses at that price floor, we've re-established an equilibrium. Quantity demanded is equal to quantity supplied once again. So we can see now in this picture the effort cost per unit for firms to get goods to market in the new equilibrium. It's this difference. This is how much the supply curve has to shift up in order to reach this new equilibrium. So that becomes the per unit effort cost. The price that firms get to collect from consumers is up here, but then they have to pay for their effort cost, this vertical distance, so the price they get to keep is down here. Same result as over in the other picture. So this is the per unit effort cost in both cases. Here consumers paid, here firms paid, and we'd have to multiply that by the number of units that are being sold to get the total effort cost that's being expended by firms and by consumers. So now we can think about what does this do to our efficiency result. Well, there are two parts to that. The first part is that we can see that we're no longer producing uh, these goods in between what's being produced after the policy and what was produced before. So the surplus that used to accrue to consumers and producers from the production of these goods will, will certainly no longer exist. So initially, consumers had surplus above the price up to the demand curve, including this triangle here. Well, that triangle here is going to go away because those goods aren't being produced anymore. Producers had a surplus below the price down to the supply curve, including this triangle, but those goods aren't being produced anymore, so that triangle is going to go away. So we know that in both cases, this triangle becomes deadweight loss. Then there's a question of what happens to this effort cost part. We can see that consumer surplus shrinks from this initial triangle to the new triangle above the cost that they, the price that they pay up to the demand curve. So they lose this square. And producer surplus goes down from this big triangle to this smaller triangle, so producers also lose this square. So what happens to this rectangle here? Well, it's the effort cost in equilibrium, and it kind of depends on what form that effort cost takes. 
if the consumers are waiting in line, then they're expending effort, that's a cost, but nobody is receiving that cost. Nobody is receiving a benefit from that. So that would be a deadweight loss. If, on the other hand, the consumers are bribing someone to be sure that they are the ones who are getting to the goods, well, then at least someone is receiving that bribe, and so it wouldn't be lost. So in that case, it wouldn't be part of deadweight loss. So it's a little bit ambiguous as to what this rectangle becomes. Is it part of deadweight loss, or is it just a transfer from one person to another? Depends on what form the effort costs take in both of these cases. So the smallest possible deadweight loss is the triangle that we're losing from the goods that we're no longer producing in both cases. But if the effort costs are truly socially wasteful, the biggest possible deadweight less loss could actually also include the rectangle in both of these cases.